deliberate. I can say happily that we don't know of any major cases where deaths have occurred from UAP. The reason for that's very interesting, that there have not been any collisions that we know of with commercial flights from UAP. Why? Because the phenomenon seems to get out of the way in time. Highly maneuverable. Great deal of energy to deal with. And uh, flying an airplane is fundamentally manipulating energy from one form to another. Um, thrust vectoring is another way of thinking about that. Well, now think about that for a moment. That if this phenomenon is so maneuverable that it can avoid a collision at the last minute, and this technical report has scores of cases like that, zipping over the top of the aircraft just at the last moment, pilot doesn't do anything. That says something about intelligence, doesn't it? It suggests technology, at least. It suggests a, an understanding of energy management that I don't think we have. Now, the skeptics, some skeptics will say that these are all visual illusions. And uh, I can't buy that. Not all these cases. Not with three sets of eyeballs in that cockpit. Uh, not with radar confirmation. Not with ground confirmation by radar. Uh, or even additional aircraft nearby. Pilots being human beings are subject to the same uh, pressures, psychological pressures as anyone is in our culture against reporting these strange experiences, these strange phenomena that shouldn't exist. The authorities tell us there's no threat. They tell us that there's nothing to worry about, that there's really nothing there. So why report something that's not really there, you see? So pilots being professionals have careers at stake. Um, and so it's easier not to report them, so they don't report them. Now, we don't know how many are not reported. All we know is the number that are reported, obviously. But my estimate is that for every one pilot who does come forward and makes a confidential or a public report, I would estimate there's 20, 30 other pilots who don't. As a result of this review of my AirCAT files, I found a number of cases back in the 60s, for instance, when the Air Force was still heavily involved in this subject, uh, where they stepped in and interrogated, interviewed, let's use the word, commercial pilots, not just their own military pilots, but commercial pilots, and ended the interview by saying, you're not to tell anybody about what you saw. Captain Kenju Teruchi was uh, piloting a Boeing 747 uh, Japan Airlines from Paris, France to Tokyo over the polar route. And I interviewed him uh, by phone. I am the only civilian to interview this gentleman. After he and his crew had uh, a major sighting over um, northern Alaska on their way to Anchorage to land for refueling. And uh, as a result of his following the rules, which he did, making a report out, landing safely, delivering the cargo, being a good pilot, Japan Airlines asked him to not fly anymore. And I happened to meet the chief medical officer for Japan Airlines on that incident, and I asked him why. Why did you relieve Captain Teruchi from his flying duties? Flying a desk, right? And his answer was, well, we convened a medical review board um, on this incident, and we decided that it was not wise for Japan Airlines to have a pilot flying who sees such strange things. And that was the answer given. So Captain Teruchi was then not demoted, I guess you'd say, but at least uh, in that culture, that's hard on the ego, and on self-image, on pride, very hard. And so I have to tell you the end of the story, and it was that uh, I may have said too much to this Japanese gentleman in a three-piece suit uh, in Japan Airlines, but I said, well, I have to disagree with you, sir. Uh, I think you have a fine pilot there. Captain Teruchi is an, a very fine pilot. He did follow the instructions. He did report accurately. He did maintain control of that aircraft at all times. He did deliver his cargo. And uh, he was not the only pilot that I know of that has seen such strange things as that. Very large objects, for instance. This was a huge object near his aircraft. 
And uh, he said, well, that's very interesting. Uh, would you like to submit any information in his behalf? And I said, I'd be delighted. So I came home and put together a, a packet about two inches thick um, where I said all this in writing and uh, appended examples from my files of similar cases to show that Captain Terucci was not the only person who's ever had an experience like this. And I sent it off to Tokyo. Never heard another thing for about, oh, I don't know, maybe six, eight months, a year, maybe even a year, I don't remember now. And I learned later uh, that he was reinstated to flying status. So he's now flying again, happy to say. There are very often uh, multicolored lights on these objects, daytime and night. Well, why do you need lights on in the daytime? You see, it has a collision avoidance perhaps, not with a, a reflecting surface. Um, the lights are not FAA approved. Very often they're blue lights, and that's not an approved air, air, aircraft color, you see. So something else is going on here. The lights are often sequenced on and off, on and off in some regular pattern. Uh, they would be rotating clockwise around the circumference, for instance. Aircraft don't have that. When we look at daylight sightings of UFO phenomena in general, there is probably more commonality than difference. I'll have to say that. For instance, they, the great majority of the phenomena reflect ambient light. What that means is it's like a bumper of a car that's polished chrome and it reflects sunlight. And you see a little image of the sun. Well, that's the kind of, of surface characteristics that the objects almost always have. Not always, but usually. Another classification of surface characteristics is pitch black, almost a black hole where it's absorbing light. Uh, for instance, during the daytime, the great majority of these objects seem to reflect light just like a solid surface would, just like a, a chrome bumper of a, of a car would reflect sunlight, for instance. Uh, however, very seldom do we see seams, markings, rivets, uh, any sort of insignias. I, I, there's almost none. That these are just smooth, aer aeronautically shaped, um, very seldom do we find sharp edges. They're usually smooth, rounded edges. Um, quite often there's a little protrusion either on the top or the bottom, or both, that some people describe as a cupola or a cockpit of some sort. And very often they're transparent. And detail can be seen inside the windows. They're very interesting. I have a number of cases where the object, or whatever it is, let's call it an object, does not reflect light, but it's pitch black. That it's a, like a black hole. It, re, it almost absorbs light. Uh, it, typically they have sharp edges, they're not fuzzy edges, which suggests a physical object there as opposed to an atmospheric, uh, an optical phenomenon. And one case in particular comes to mind. And this is a Canadian pilot flying by himself in a two-engine propeller uh, cargo aircraft, a DC-3. And he's flying about sundown to the south after having dropped off an oil crew uh, at a little uh, dirt strip north of in Canada, Saskatchewan, I think it was. And he's flying about 5,000 feet altitude, about ready to land. And his wife is down there, has a coffee on, and a, a, the radio on. And he radios to her that, hey, honey, I'm going to be home in 20 minutes, get the coffee going, and I'm, I'm hungry. And he said to me that off to the western horizon, the sun is about on the horizon ready to go down, he noticed a black speck. And at that great distance off to his right, he thought it was another aircraft. So he kept an eye on it. He just keeps on going straight ahead, obviously. He said this object, whatever it was, was at his altitude and moving rather quickly from right to left until it was pretty much right ahead of him. And then he said it stopped. It came to an abrupt, halt right in front of his aircraft and he started to gain uh, the distance was lessening and it got bigger and bigger and bigger. I said well what did it look like? He said it looked like a bullet. It was flat on its rear end, pointed on its front and kind of parallel at the top and then it tapered down to the, to the point on the front. Well what did you do? 
He said, nothing I could do. Uh, it was just there in front of me. And then it maintained distance. It, it just um, kept a constant distance. It didn't change in size, in other words. So we're equating size of the object with separation distance. And what happened, I said? Well, after some minutes, it just continued on its way in its original direction. End of story, almost. He radioed his wife to describe what had happened he, and, and found out that they lost some, she, he'd lost some time. Some time had passed, longer than should have normally from where he was to where he should be going to, to land the aircraft. And I suspect when the object was right ahead, that's when the t missing time occurred. And for a pilot to look you in the eye and tell you that, you know, at 100 yards distance at altitude, that has a great emotional impact on me, I must say.